Time now for the Sunday Talk, where we tap into the debate of the week. Policy for women, news for women, special days off for women. Has feminism gone too far? A female directing a Wonder Woman blockbuster. Wall Street's fearless girl statue. Massive turnouts for a day without women. Women united will never be divided. Women push back this year. Some politicians picked up the feminist agenda too. We will stop working with the partners who are not able to put women and girls at the heart of their policy. Student health. The Trudeau government announced its new feminist foreign aid plan with 95% of spending for women and girls. And then this, special days off just for women. It may seem like a controversial idea, but is an already existing law in Indonesia, Korea and Japan. You know, debates are raging around the world about whether women should be given menstrual leave, different than sick days. This would be a completely uh, ridiculous, old-fashioned idea. It's not so much um, a stereotype as a very real problem. Um, I do find my periods uh, debilitating. And the latest, most newspapers got rid of the woman's section years ago. But the Washington Post has brought it back, launching a new platform for women's news called The Lily. So are all these plans just for women progress or a setback? Here they anticipate trends, gather general news of interest to all women, pass on homemakers' hints, and above all, report on the latest fashions. <laughs> I'm joined by our panelists. Jonathan Kay is an author and freelance columnist. Supriya Devetti is a talk radio host in Toronto. And Tasha Carradine is a talk radio host and columnist with iPolitics. So do you turn to the women's pages to get all your fashion <laughs> advice, Tasha? What do no, you think? No, I, I don't. Um, and uh, I, I look at the, the lily with uh, bemusement. I think it's more a question of getting advertising dollars than making progress for women because it's, to me, ghettoizing the news. There's nothing wrong with having magazines for women, magazines for men, magazines for... But here it's the Washington Post um, curating, as they put it, stories for women because I guess they don't think they'll read them in the main paper. So... I don't see necessarily that as progress. What's your sense overall, Supriya? Has feminism gone mad here? No, I mean, I don't think so. And I think specifically if we're talking about the Washington Post, I don't think the Washington Post is doing anything new. New York Magazine has The Cut, uh, Slate has XX, Univision has Jezebel, and Vice has Broadly. So curating news for women is definitely not something new. I think the Washington Post likely looked uh, at a lot of their competitors mm -hmm. and said this is where we can make money. It's mm -hmm. not so much about yay lean in feminism, <laughs> but it's more let's get some ad dollars. Where are the men's point. newspapers? Uh, they are the newspapers. That's the thing. <laughs> it's just the regular newspaper. So it's needed, you think? Uh, I don't know if it's... I, I, I would say to a degree, if there's an appetite out there for it, why not create... If, if the market's already there, why not cater to it? What do you think, John? We'll bring you in as the man <laughs> at the table. I'll tread carefully here. Uh, <laughs> a, a few months ago, I subscribed to a daily email newsletter. It's called The Skim. I'm not sure if... You ladies are familiar. Uh, it's it's a, it's a female oriented. It's it's oriented towards sort of younger, educated, urban women, and it presents the day's news um, in a way that you could you could tell it's it's marketed and oriented toward women. And I actually a friend of mine happens to be a woman. Uh, she said, "Oh, you know, should check this out. It's interesting." And I read it for a few weeks. I got to say, I was a little bit horrified because it actually there was a lot of stereotypes in there. Hmm. Like it was sort of like discussion of foreign policy, but in sort of like a giggly way. And oh, here's what your boyfriend might ask you and stuff like that. Like it was. I, I remember reading it's it. It's trying to simplify things. Well, so there's, yes. there's, there's, there's this, th this hazy line between, oh, this is good, it's feminist, it's for women, but then you deliver the product, and I, I'm a man, but reading it, I was like, this strikes me as sexist. And the Washington Post, the Lily, does the same thing with some stories um, where it actually, I would say, dumbs them down. Uh, and I don't know if it's a function of the readership. It's a younger readership, so it's, a, it's being uh, discriminating against millennials or thinking millennials are too, uh, I don't know, unaware to read the that Washington Post, or it's female millennials, in this case, are not not able to read the regular Washington Post. But that is, to me, again, I think it really, again, goes to this, this sense of a long tail of advertising or marketing, is that companies are searching for niches, and women have just become one of those niches, and they're going to see everything through this, this gendered lens that you mentioned, which I don't think helps women's causes at all. Yeah, I was checking out the, the what the stories were. There was one about kittens. There was one about how to make donuts. <laughs> but there, there was more serious <laughs> stuff, too. So we'll see where that goes. What do you think, uh, Supriya, about the whole 
menstrual leave a proposal? So I do think there's a segment of the population, of the female population, that does have very bad period cramps. I, I think it's, it's medically it's called something, like, like premenstrual dys dysphoria disorder, disorder or something. Like dysphoria or something. Yeah, yeah. Yes. so I think if you do have a legitimate medical condition, then you should, you know, have to be able to get some sort of reprieve in that, and if that's by way of sick days, then sure and fine. But, you know, if, if I, I would love to call in sick and be like, I have my period, <laughs> sorry, can't do the show. But, I mean, I, I don't think we're, we're going anywhere with that. And I think we're also just playing into a lot of the stereotypes that are already out there for women not being able to handle it. Well, this but, may yeah, surprise I, you, but yeah. Vladimir Putin... Yeah, is for he, it. Yeah, well, he was tweeting that I don't have bad days because I'm not a woman. Well, it, exactly. But I, I will say this. If men did get their periods, uh, the whole week would be off and everything would shut down, so... <laughs> I think it's, it goes to this old view of women as hysterical, hysteria. We know in the Victorian era, women were considered uh, inferior because they were prone to this kind of hysteria. And this is kind of the same thing. It lumps all women into one basket. Some women will have very bad debilitating cramps, no question. And if that's but a medical But should they have issue, to use up their sick days for that? I guess that's the argument well, being if, made. Well, if a man had an issue, a sick issue that was uh, connected to him, if he had, uh, you know, testicular cancer, for example, had to take time off for that, uh, you would say, well, it's part of well, his sick leave package. Well, there's girl bits that get cancer, too. Yes, and girl bits, too. <laughs> Do. And but this is just the thing. Some things, some conditions, women will have that men will never have. Uh, women, men will not have babies. Most of them don't anyway. I think there's been one or two in the world who may have had children. But that there are biological differences, and this is the, the real, I think, root of um, women's inequality and fighting it is different than fighting other groups' inequality because there's a biological difference you can't erase, which is women have children. And there are all sorts of things, whether it's period cramps, that connected to that. Whereas if you're talking about inequality between cultures or races, it's not John's the same just dying. I know that men love Jump having in. discussions about uh, women's so, uh, one How was your last period? Uh, <laughs> so I, I think it's interesting that, that we're having this conversation because I think uh, it goes to the question of trust. I think 10 or 15 years ago, um, there probably are a lot of people who wouldn't want to have this conversation because they would suspect, rightly, that, uh, that men, employers, educators would seize on it and saying, aha, women can't do this kind of job. They, they have this debilitating condition. Now, at least, we're in an era where people can talk about it as, as a biological fact, as a medical fact. But, of course, you have to be careful not to medicalize the idea of being a woman. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is where, where trust comes in, where you have to be able to have a debate where it's not like Vladimir Putin comes in and says, well, you know, this, it's great, I'm not a woman. It, mm -hmm. It's implying there's a hierarchy. Uh, on the other hand, um, you know, I, I think if you do have this as a medical reality, you're probably thankful that we now live in an era when you can talk about it, uh, ten years ago, I don't think you could. I guess I, I'm just wondering whether overall, and we've just picked three examples that happened in the last week or so, but overall, is this empowering for women, all of these developments that the, 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 you call the ghettoization, the, mm -hmm. the, the sort of special attention for women's issues? I don't really see it as special attention. I see it as right now you have most of the spaces that are predominated by, by male voices, uh, by a specific subset of that in demographic, and I... If there's more of a, an appetite out there, I don't know why we wouldn't be catering to those vo to other you know voices if people want to be listening to them. And so I, I do agree uh, presenting something in a way of like the economy failing and going doing it in kitten gifts is a little <laughs> bit like okay that, that that's a little bit much. But for example, I, I mean uh, you know there was a con congressional testimony last week all throughout for in the U.S. and the only reason why I knew how many times Kamala Harris, who's a black female senator, how many times she was interrupted was because Jezebel was on it and they were. Live tweeting, and any time uh, you know she was interrupted by one of her male colleagues, it was brought to my attention via via Jezebel's Twitter feed. Well, the thing though, and that's interesting. You see that Jezebel was the one tweeting it because um, the real issue for women too is not simply that they are the ones advancing their cause. We need men on board with this cause as well. And if yeah, you get a wise, sure, that's but if all you well get good, a wise, women are always at the front line, just as like yes, blacks are always at the front line to you, for, 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 civil, for for civil rights equality. My point though is, if you get a wise, the news in particular, if you say, okay, women's publications are going to deal with women's issues, what that does, that doesn't reach the male audience that you uh, also need. I, so if I could just jump in as a um, male, yes, as a male. I can say that one of the th reasons I think it may be valuable is that men are actually quite terrified in the modern age of talking about women. Because <laughs> I, because I don't think society has, has decided whether women have these strong, diverse voices that are just completely different in some biological way from men, or if it's more progressive to think about women and men as being completely equal and, 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 and similar uh, from, from an employment context. And so I think men are caught in the middle. That if, if they talk about differences, 
and diversity, they're accused of stereotypes. And if they talk about sameness, they're accused of, of biological naivety. So I think we have to take the lead the from paradox, something like it, the this lily. This is the yeah. paradox of the same thing of women, because women say they want equality and equal rights. At the same time, they want to be treated differently because they have certain Some differences. They want to be treated differently. Well, well period days, no. I would say that is, that is a biological. Days. The examples were Indonesia that, and South Korea and right, Japan. Right, which I would say are not necessarily, if, as a woman, those, I don't know how advanced women cultures. are it's not exactly in their societies. A, a, but that's not exactly an egalitarian society no, that's like, let's set it's aside. The it's the paradox of saying we are equal and the same, but we are not the same. And that is what a lot of men, and you can, I'd be interested in your view on that, a I'm lot of men I'm very confused. are confused by this. Yes, I'm very confused. Yes. I, I, I don't think most men my age are that confused. I don't mean to make this into a, a, a generational thing, but I, I think coming up, millennial men and, 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 and the men that are even younger than that sort of see it in a way of, okay, they all grew up with Jezebel. They, are, they all grew up with Broadly. It's not different to have, or, and, and like, guys, like New York Magazine, the cut has existed for quite some time. The Washington Post That's doing this I, I isn't novel. That's the issue of power, not so much the specifics that we've talked about, the issue of empowerment, what empowerment means for women. Because uh, women themselves will say, we want equality, absolutely. But it's not the same, like I said, of other groups in society that don't face a biological difference. That will never be erased. Women have children. Even if they don't choose to, they are seen as someone who can. And that puts you at a disadvantage in your career. It puts you, because you will make different choices because of your biological reality. Got to wrap up in 30 seconds, but I just want a quick note from the two of you. Is this first world women's problems? I mean, are, are there more serious things we should be looking at? It's a little bit first, look, a lot of things Even we though, talk about. Even though, as you say, it is in the third world. A, a, lot, of, a lot of things yeah, we talk imposed. about first world, but I think it's the beginning of a new conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think, and my male perspective, I'm quite limited on this, but I'm taking the cue from some of these new media outlets, which is like, how are we going to have this conversation? Because men, I think, notwithstanding Jezebel, I, <laughs> I, you know, I'm sure a lot of our male viewers are, are, are reading Jezebel <laughs> they're, they're right now. Giggling as uh, we yeah. speak. <laughs> uh, you know, they, they don't know how to have this conversation, and they're, maybe they're looking to some of these new outlets for a lead Last in how to resolve the tension. Um, look, I, whenever we, we have arguments like this or debates like this, it always ends up with, well, what about Afghanistan or what about female genital mutilation that's happening, you know, in, in, in Africa? I think we can walk and chew gum at the same time. I think I can be advancing causes of, of gender pay equity here in North America and at the same time be, care, be caring about forced marriage in India. Uh, I, can do, I can care about both things equally. Well, we stirred up a few things here. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was Thank interesting. You.